we actually don't need that much more copper, for example. We don't need that, that much more glass. We don't need that much more aluminum. You'd have to be an idiot to think that we're not moving towards something like nuclear power over time. That's just the history of power generation. And so uranium can have its own interesting bull market dynamics. We're not gonna run out of X commodity, I assure you. The universe is a really big place. It's got tons of commodities. The simple reality is given enough energy, you can do any of those things. Energy is what's scarce. Do you believe that money managers ever go back to the exposures to commodities that they had in the 70s or even the early 2000s? No, no mm -hmm. I don't. I, I actually am. I, I actually think gold is interesting because among other things, gold has some unique properties to it. All right, Michael, um, I'm assuming you need no introduction, but uh, I'm going to write one in the description on the list for people who are interested in it, as well as uh, I'll put a link to your Substack and just simplify as well, just so people can check it out. Uh, why no introductions? Because I'm rushing to be selfish, basically, because I want to know whatever is happening out there, I, I, like whatever's happening in macro more specifically these days, because I just don't get it anymore. Not that I ever got it, but there's like the, right now there's more stable parts of the economy. And then there's also softer parts of the economy. So you can make both a bullish and a bearish argument at the same time. And we have monetary tightening as of still, but we have fiscal loosening going into 2024. So I know the vaguest of questions here, but what, what in the world is, is going on out there? Well, so, so I would hit on a couple of different components. Um, one, when you say what is going on, I think all of us are a little confused. Used um, the easiest way to think about what's transpired is is, is it's almost like a you know uh, antediluvian and then a post diluvian type framework with COVID representing the equivalent of you know the uh, biblical flood right so the world has changed in a very substantive manner post COVID um, that means that a lot of the dynamics that played out whether that was people uh, commuting into work in center cities to the way that we construct our lives uh, in online interviews versus offline, right? You and I probably would not have been able to have this type of conversation pre-COVID because the deployment of things like Zoom had not hit that urgency component. And so many aspects of our lives have changed in very, very fundamental ways. And I think everyone's head is still a little spinning on that. Um, just like our heads are spinning, data sets are spinning, right? We don't really know how to seasonally adjust, having come through a period in which the world was shut down for roughly 18 months. Um, I think the entire process, I think the entire behavior set was completely insane and indicative of the terrible leadership that we have and the general, you know, uh, incredibly distressing state of education that we actually know how to handle things like novel respiratory viruses and due to political concerns, we effectively decided to run around like chickens with our heads cut off and panic in, in the face of something that is uh, unfortunately quite easily defined. And every generation, almost every generation has dealt with something similar, whether that was the Hong Kong flu or the Spanish flu. Um, you know, we've never before have had the perception of surplus that would allow us to say, yeah, you know, why don't we just stop working, right? Um, so a lot of people feel very disconnected and disjointed. And that's then exacerbated, in my view, through some of the, uh, the changing characteristics on what we use for signaling our well-being, right? Mm -hmm. um, Janet Yellen came out the other day and said, you know, everybody should be really happy because everybody has a job, everybody's employed, et cetera. And yet, if you look at the data sets, the fraction of people who have both a full-time job and a second-time job, a part-time job, in order to make ends meet has soared to new all-time highs. Um, that doesn't, you know, that doesn't lead to happiness, right? That's not actually a happy scenario when you sacrifice significant quantities of leisure time. And at the same time, we've seen a tremendous bifurcation of our economy between those who are true knowledge workers and are able to take advantage of these types of situations and those who are um, perhaps more bound by traditional components. You know, people are genuinely struggling, right, um, to, to make sense of this all. Uh, if you add on an additional layer to that, you know, the way that we think about getting signals for what is likely to happen in the future has increasingly been outsourced to markets. So we use the S&P 500 or the NASDAQ 100 to indicate what the future outlook should, should appear. That is strongly disassociated from things like uh, investor surveys. It's strongly disassociated from purchasing manager surveys.
population surveys, consumer surveys, et cetera, they're all showing us data that looks very different than what we're seeing in financial markets. And I think that just adds to the general angst that people are experiencing. Um, and so your situation, I don't think is at all uncommon. And I think part of the, you know, not only do we have this pre-Diluvian, anti-Diluvian COVID dynamic, we also have a remarkable change that is occurring, and I spend a lot of time talking about this, particularly with resource investors, where the 20th century itself was very, very unique versus anything that came before it. The 21st century is also going to almost by definition be unique, but the, the underlying characteristics have just so radically shifted that I still don't think it's fully penetrated the public consciousness. Um, what I'm referring to in particular is the changing demographics. And so people are familiar with the terrible demographics for China. They're familiar with the terrible demographics for Japan. They're familiar with the terrible demographics for Germany, Europe, et cetera, where the populations are now actually shrinking in many of those countries. Certainly working age populations are declining. That's leading to incredibly tight labor markets because the supply of workers that are joining the labor force in any period are very, very low. That's leading to perceptions of tightness. And yet at the same time, workers in many situations feel disempowered because they look around and they say, well, where are the opportunities for growth? And they're 100% correct that they really aren't there because the population growth itself creates its own opportunity. Mm. And so the, the characteristic of the 20th century, and I, I use this all the time for people, and I'll actually show you a chart on this, is the 20th century was truly unique in the rate of growth of the global population because going into the 20th century, we figured out basically what was killing people, right? It was largely bacterial and um, uh, accidental uh, behaviors that were leading to early termination of most human beings. Things like um, uh, uh, typhoid fever or septic infection for women giving birth, um, you know, various forms of childhood communicable diseases like measles, et cetera. Over the course of the early 20th century, late 19th century, we sold almost all of those, right? And so, again, that's one of the reasons why something like COVID was so terrifying because people are like, oh my gosh, I can get sick and die? Like, that's, that's terribly frightening. That has never even occurred to me. I understand I can die from cancer, right? That feels extremely rare, but a communicable disease that doesn't involve sexually transmitted, you know, components like an HIV, and even with HIV, you saw the panic associated with it. Uh, you're a little bit too young to remember that. I certainly remember it in the early 1980s. Yeah. Totally ruined my dating experiences. But the um, you know the underlying dynamics of something happening like that just feels so incredibly alien to us mm -hmm. that we reacted very differently than would have generations before. And just mm -hmm. the mechanical property of that, let me actually show you this chart. You know, th this is the history of population growth by century, right? And you can see the 21st century, the 20th century just looks like nothing that ever came before it. The 19th century itself was an acceleration as we had opened up the new world, creating significant land surplus, at least for the what we refer to today as the developed world. And then we solved all these diseases that led to early termination and people just lived much, much longer on a much more consistent basis. That picture is now changing radically. And if we actually look at the second half of this century, most indications are there will be zero net population growth. Within the developed world, it is highly likely to contract. Um, and labor forces almost inevitably are going to contract. The United States, despite positive immigration pressures, is seeing its labor force grow only in the neighborhood of about 0.1% per year. Again, in places like Japan, Germany, et cetera, that's actually shrinking. Now, a lot of people think about that as inherently inflationary because they're very trapped in the mode that says, you know, labor costs are tied to the supply of labor as labor prices go higher. Therefore, prices have to rise and will experience inflationary conditions. But that's actually really not true at all, because what labor really is, is people saying, I am willing to trade my leisure time in exchange for additional consumption. And that additional consumption is really the key thing. Nobody gets off their sofa and goes to work if they're perfectly happy with their level of production and they're currently very satisfied with it. Hmm. And so you have this really weird underlying dynamic that effectively says everybody's worried about the supply of labor and how that's going to impact prices.
But unfortunately, all the indications are actually that that actually translates to a world of very weak demand growth. And if you have weak demand growth, it becomes really easy for very modest innovations in productive capacity to satiate that incremental demand that can emerge from rising living standards or anything else. Mm. That's obviously made worse if we have falling living standards. And so what we actually are seeing is an environment like the COVID pandemic where we disrupt supply chains, but because aggregate demand doesn't really grow very much, we actually wake up particularly for traditional goods, things like consumption, you know, toilet paper, for example, or, um, you know, how much food we actually need. All of those things actually get resolved very, very quickly. Whereas in the 1960s and 1970s, in the part and the steepest part of this population growth, where we saw the green revolution and the spread of Western technology that again, eradicated early childhood mortality rates, women mortality during childbirth, et cetera, led to explosive population growth in the emerging markets. You know, in all of those situations, that's simply more mouths to feed. And so when you encountered supply disruptions in the 1970s in the United States, you experienced a shortage of production. Let's say you have a production shortfall tied to an OPEC, uh, uh, oil embargo that means that production ends up being 5% less than you would like it to be. Hmm. If the labor force and the underlying demand are growing by 3 to 5%, that means you now have 10% that you have to make up just to catch up, right? Under the COVID dynamics, when you have very little aggregate population growth, and you have very little underlying demand growth, you actually discover that it's very easy to solve the supply shortages. You can do all sorts of terrible and make, make all sorts of terrible choices around how you do that, but it becomes very easy. And so the inflationary consequences of these things are resolved in a very different manner. We actually don't need that much more copper, for example. We don't need that, that much more glass. We don't need that much more aluminum because we're able to recycle it in particular from infrastructure and places where it's just been overbuilt, right? I mean, people talk about the EV demand, the electric vehicle demand for copper, I'd highlight that there's two separate components to that. One is it's highly likely, unlikely that the rest of the world consumes EVs that look anything like what we've consumed so far in the United States. Tesla, you know, sports vehicles that go from zero to 60 in 2.6 seconds are not the basic transportation needs in places like China, India, et cetera, right? They're much more likely to have something that looks an awful lot like a golf cart. The second component is, is that when you think about even those EVs themselves, we're getting much better at changing the structure of the auto, right? Tesla is actually somewhat unique because they purpose built their vehicles to be electric. We're starting to see other manufacturers wake up to those sorts of dynamics. And when they do so, they begin thinking, well, maybe I should change the wiring harness. Maybe I should rethink the, the gauge of the wire that actually exists. And you actually begin reducing the quantity of materials that are required that lowers the cost. It also lowers the material intensity of it. A really simple example, the wiring harness on an electric vehicle. You know, when you look at something like a Tesla, which includes copper wiring across a battery pack that goes, you know, to thousands of cylindrical cells as compared to the prismatic pattern uh, packages that many others are employing, or a move to something like solid state batteries, if that were to occur, you know, the quantity of copper wire that's required is multiples of what's required once you've solved that solution, mm. right? And so you end up in this situation where it actually, again, just becomes really hard to create conditions of material intensity when you have much lower population growth than you've ever had, than you've had in recent memory. It, it's interesting you bring up copper specifically because when you were talking about demographic shrinking basically i was thinking about well then if that's the case you need something that has that knows inelastic demand but is labor intensive like copper uh because copper is not only used in evs uh but so there's still a baseline of of demand for copper that doesn't go away as quickly and definitely not as quickly uh or definitely not as slowly as we could ramp up production if that makes sense so again labor intensive but inelastic demand goods or, or commodities, wouldn't that make sense to you? Um, I think that it goes in both directions, right? Remember that the way capitalism, and again, if we're going to run into problems, it's because people abandon these solutions that capitalism entails. 
But when prices rise for copper, as they did in the aftermath of COVID, people figure out solutions that allow them to use less copper. I don't know if any of your listeners have ever pulled the wiring out of a home that was built around 1900 and looked at the gauge, the thickness of the copper wiring that was used. Remember, they didn't have rubber insulation or high quality insulation, which meant that they had to use much more copper in the actual wiring itself. Once you develop the technology for sheathed and insulated cables, you can use much less copper. You can um, blend together small copper wires individually that will actually have less resistance in aggregate than the large diameter wiring in its totality, right? All of these types of innovations, the wonderful thing about technology and the ability to write stuff down or even better communicate it electronically over the internet is that you're able to very quickly diffuse that knowledge that means that everybody benefits from those technological innovations. And so on the demand side of the equation, the, the, the reason why capitalism and modern innovations work is because everybody is able to take advantage of those, right? On the supply side, you're correct. It is really hard to get a copper mine up and running and you will continually encounter supply shortages during phases like we just saw where China tries to emerge as the world's producer. China was woefully under commoditized. It had far too little you know, raw materials relative to its population if it was going to offer modern amenities like electricity, et cetera. Um, the process of implementing that growth and shifting production to China created an outward surge in commodity demand that was somewhat unique and then further exacerbated during the 2005 to 2000 an eight time period by institutional investment patterns and commodities that hadn't really existed before that. We ended up effectively hoarding during that time period. Um, the price spikes that were created in that time period and then the immediate aftermath with China's stimulus from 2008 to 2011, we really haven't surpassed those in any commodities. So as much as we think that this has been a time period of rising commodity prices, Almost everything actually says the opposite, that we're really looking at a time period in which commodity prices have been quite restrained, um, but that feels very unhappy and untrue to individuals themselves who are struggling against rising costs and a general sense of malaise that I think actually has very different characteristics sitting at its core. Hmm. Well, gold's at an all-time high right now, though. Yeah, I mean, but it's, yes, it is at an all-time high, but at the same time, gold is, is um, very modestly changed since 2011, is I guess the way that I would actually put it. Yeah, yeah. No, so the, the, the first thing that popped into my mind is, is gold because it's, it's been in the news so much. Uh, but we, I mean, gold is also quite different than copper, obviously. As, as totally it's, agree. I think that's I mean, actually a really important point. Um, the chart that I was actually going to show you, here's, this is... This is actually directly off of my sub stack. Uh, if you take a look at this picture, this is actually just, you know, again, these are like the novel data sets that I think are important for people to be able to visualize for themselves. This is looking at global population growth relative to the frequency of the use of the word commodity in books, right? We, we really didn't think that much about it in the 1800s. Mm. Right. It only became a resource shortage during that time of the 1960s, 1970s. And today, like commodities, while they feel incredibly important and we can construct narratives for things like uranium and copper. And I, but to be very clear, I'm not actually suggesting those are bad investments. I'm simply saying that we have to be aware that the characteristic of the underlying demand is likely to be very different than what we saw in the 1950s, 1960s, 1970s. Mm -hmm. Right. So if we look at, at, you know, the underlying importance of commodities, you, you know, when you think about something like the CPI, crazily enough, or, or the immediate aftermath of World War II, like Europe was dealing with shortages of scrap cloth and paper. They didn't have enough paper, right? All the woods, you know, go back and watch Band of Brothers and, and watch uh, uh, the experience that they had in, um, you know, the woods where the woods are being blown up by, you know, incoming military, right? Europe had largely deforested. Now you go to Europe, Europe's got tons of wood, tons mm -hmm. of paper, tons of supply. And it's just a very different environment than we had through at least what we think of as the recent history books. Mm -hmm.
I wish we had a uh, Google back then so we can trace the Google search for commodities. That would be better. It um, would be better. I agree with you. Unfortunately, there are ways that you can do it. You can look at what I did in that chart is use the Google search function. So there's something called Ngram, which looks at the frequency of the use of the word in published books. Google has basically compiled compiled all the books that ever existed. That's why um, and allows you to go back and say, you know, how frequently did this word actually appear? And the fact that it overlaps almost perfectly with population growth to me is actually strongly indicative that there's really something to this underlying thesis that we are moving post scarcity, which creates its own interesting challenges. Hmm. But then in the this sounds like an, an overarching view of, of whatever's happening in the commodities or whatever is going to happen over, let's say, the next 100 years. But then in between, there's still the possibility of, you know, two, three, five year bull market, you know, pockets 100%. of bull markets. That's that, absolutely. I completely and totally agree with that. And I think it's mm -hmm. actually very important for people to acknowledge that and to understand that. But we are looking at a very different environment than we had in prior periods. And I think that's also equally important to understand that a commodity cycle, you know, that effectively created conditions under which Dustin Hoffman is approached by somebody to say the future is plastics, right? Well, we actually can pretty clearly say the future is not plastics. We're doing everything we can to get the things out of the ocean and everything else, right? So are we figuring out alternatives? Will we create additional demand for raw materials? Uranium is a fantastic example, right? Again, whether it's uranium or thorium, you'd have to be an idiot to think that we're not moving towards something like nuclear power over time. That's just the history of power generation. And so uranium can have its own interesting bull market dynamics, but uranium is not scarce. It's really mm -hmm. not. I mean, it's scarce in its underlying supply because we have not invested in the production of it. But once we begin investing in the production of it, there's millions of years of supply of uranium. In fact, half the Earth's budget of energy, about half of it comes from the sun, about half of it comes from the decay of nuclear particles in the Earth's core and crust. You know, people forget that, right? I mean, these are there's, there's a lot of energy that's out there. And I, I actually think, I mean, I've written, you know, very extensively on this. I think that is really what we missed and what you're correctly picking up when you say, hey, I think there's an opportunity in uranium, is that people have ignored the underlying fact, which is that energy is life, right? Mm -hmm. And what we actually have been experiencing is a tremendous shortage of energy per capita because we've governed ourselves for the past 50 years under a nonsensical claim that like we just have to do, you know, we have to have less. We can't do as much. We can't have as much energy. That's yeah. just a terribly, you know, pessimistic way to approach the world. And it's wrong, fundamentally wrong. It, it's also historically wrong because if you, if you look back at this, obviously not my take, it's something I've read online, but it, if you look back at the, um, the energy density ladder that we've climbed is that we, yeah. we've always gone towards more dense energy. We've never gone back that ladder. Um, what do you, what do you, think about that because we, we were talking about there being pockets of bullishness but if we go towards um more and more towards nuclear where whether it's smrs or whatever it is i interviewed a nuclear engineer a couple of um a couple of weeks ago and he said thorium is nowhere near um commercial commercial scale or commercial usage now but maybe in 20 yeah. years but wouldn't that i mean would, wouldn't uranium make basically the most sense out of the commodities in your opinion, given given just that claim alone, that we've never gone back the energy density ladder in the past. Um, well, we actually have. I mean, we, we you know we are currently going back the energy ladder, right? We're moving away from fossil fuels, which have significant density and allow you. The, the The important thing to remember about coal is that it is effectively trees that died millions of years ago, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's the easiest way to think about it. So when you move from burning wood to create your energy. Wood is effectively solar that is accumulated over the course of, let's make it simplistic and say 100 or 200 years, right? It gathers energy from the sun, converts it into cellulosic material. That cellulosic material, when subjected to high heat, releases this chemical energy in a burst of energy that allows us to release 100 years worth of solar energy in a single fire, right? Mm 
a coal coal does the exact same thing with much less water content so you don't need to heat the water and evaporate it before it begins to combust and the second thing that it does is instead of using 100 years worth of energy it allows you to compress basically thousands of years worth of energy millions of years worth of energy if you go to fossil fuels it's doing the same thing with an even denser and longer um, carbon chain, methane would be the cleanest burning one, for example, where there is no water content really in it, right? And you're effectively releasing nearly pure energy. But those are ultimately multiples of energy density of like two to three X, right? So the energy density of coal versus wood, I believe is about two and a half. I think fossil fuels are about three and a half. When you start going to nuclear, you're talking about shifts in energy density of 10, excuse yeah. me, 10,000 X. Right. And so it's, you know, that that ladder that you're highlighting, you're 100 percent correct on. We've just behaved like absolute idiots. Right. But by talking about, you know, the persistence of the, the, the nuclear waste that is produced, but then nuclear waste relative to the energy content that is produced is infinitesimally small. Yes. And it's even less if you go through things like reprocessing. Right. So we've been cap captured by historically. Um, uh, unscientific period in which people, you know, decided that they hated human beings and wanted to make sure that there were not as many of them. We're now actually seeing the outcome of that with a dramatic slowdown in in uh, um, human population, and it's in large part because we've robbed people of, you know, the magical demon, um, you know, of Jevon's uh, analysis in terms of the steam engine, right? What you actually have is you've got a slave that does stuff for you, right? A magical demon that releases energy and work for you. We stop thinking like that. We stop saying, hey, wait a second, what is the human potential when given unlimited amounts of energy relative to what came before? And that's really what we're suffering from. Again, I'll just share another chart. You know, this is looking at the United States, so it's going to be slightly different if I look globally, but this is U.S. energy consumption per capita. And so there's websites out there that are devoted to things like what happened in 1971, right? WTF 1971. Well, this is what happened in 1971. We stopped actually increasing the quantity of energy per capita. And when you start thinking about the implications of that, right, I mean, on an annual basis, this gap is traveling to the moon and back twice per year. I mean, that's like, just stop and think about it. 1,500 hours of passenger travel in a Boeing 787. That means you could literally spend two thirds of your waking hours, you know, transiting the globe on a Boeing 77 with the energy that you don't have relative to the trajectory that we were on in the course of most of the 20th century, mm -hmm. right? And we know that this is what people actually want because what do rich people do? They fly private, right? They take advantage of the fact that this energy is available to them. And that's what everybody should be doing. And when you move to much denser energy sources, it becomes far less impactful to the environment. It becomes far less dangerous. Everybody ends up happier. And, you know, that confusion and frustration that you're experiencing, that other people are experiencing, is a direct byproduct of this inane policy pattern that we've followed. And so mm -hmm. I hope you're right and that uranium ends up being in a fantastic shortage and that the price of uranium, which is actually irrelevant to the production of power from a nuclear engineering standpoint, I hope the price goes up a lot. And I hope you guys are absolutely correct. The nuclear is is totally the solution to this. Mm. Well, you were also saying that we 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 are maybe starting to go back that ladder and we are definitely, especially Germany, is trying to go back on that ladder with wind and solar, right? Because they're less energy dense than than um, nuclear. Do you think that in any way? First of all, do you think that's realistic from your standpoint? And do you think in any way it it can drive commodity demand like silver, iron, ore, or whatever else it might be? Oh. I think it can, but also remember that the byproduct of moving to a dramatically denser fuel source ultimately means that the cost cost of production of those things is likely to plummet, right? Mm -hmm. So almost all commodities that are available, and I know that this, you know, somebody's going to scream into the screen as I say this, and I, I point out that, you know, seawater has dissolved basically more commodities than we could ever possibly imagine using. Mm -hmm. The reason you don't tap into those resources is due to cost, right? We all sit there as we, you know, 
humbly recycle the packages that we receive at our home and we put them into, we put in, you know, landfill trash and then we take the aluminum cans and we put them in something and we take the paper and we put it in another thing and we're, we're doing all that work, right? The reason why you have to do that is again, because it is energy expensive to separate materials back down to relatively chemically pure elements, right? So taking aluminum out of a can converting it where it's been mixed in with a whole bunch of stuff and coatings and everything else to make it fit for human consumption and useful for what we're doing. Converting that back into raw aluminum takes energy. Well, if you've got tons more energy, you don't have to worry about sorting your trash. You don't have to worry about doing all these things, right? You just burn things in more efficient engine un ovens that go to higher temperatures and you're able to separate out everything you possibly want. That's yeah. literally what a star is doing, right? Um, so we have the capacity to increase production, I would argue, far more when we move to a less energy dense environment. But the shortages that can emerge along the path of doing that certainly can create investment opportunities. Mm. And that's exactly what I'm wondering about when talking to someone like yourself, because I don't even know how Wall Street, to, to say that way, how, how how does Wall Street look at that type of thing? And, and you know, large money managers in general look at investing in commodities. and uh, I'm not sure I have a direct question here, but it, it's often mentioned that you know professional money managers have barely any exposure left to commodities, and that it's even dropping as the exposure to passive investments is growing. It's sort of a, an almost um, a, yep. a perfect it's negative a correlation. Uh, yeah. So uh, look, I think you hit on exactly the issue, which is um, the type of discussion that I'm having, where I've said, you know, look, I'm not actually particularly worried about shortages because of this long arc of history type dynamic. The vast majority of professional investors are not approaching it from that standpoint. They're basically saying, can I make money with it today? Right. And the simple reality, you know, there's a refrain on on Twitter, uh, which I'm sure, you know, you're familiar with, which is, you know, can't even beat in the S&P 500. Right. Well, the S&P 500 is mechanically inflated and the stocks that are in the S&P 500 are mechanically inflated by policy choices that we have engaged in that direct people to invest in the S&P 500, right? Or in a total market index that is constructed with a momentum weight. And so that's, you know, the work that I'm most known for is the work uh, highlighting the underlying inconsistencies with passive investing where people are buying indexes. Um, the problem is actually not that you're gonna underperform by doing that, which a lot of people have tried to make as the primary component, it's that you're actually going to drive misallocation of resources from a societal framework when you engage in strategies that are simplistic and built on very flawed models of the world, right? So like a flawed model of the world, I would argue is one that says, oh my gosh, we're gonna run out of X commodity. Right? We're not going to run out of X commodity, I assure you. The universe is a really big place. It's got tons of commodities. There are lots available. And, you know, as you know, Bitcoiners will point out, if you're really worried about gold, well, somewhere out there, there's a gold asteroid. We'll figure out how to mine it. We'll create tons more gold. And guess what? Everything will be great. Now, I know somebody's screaming into the screen, that's stupid. But, you know, the simple reality is given enough energy, you can do any of those things. Energy is what's scarce. Energy is what you need. Energy is what life is ultimately about. The entire development of self-replicating, you know, chemical chains, which is really what life is a function of, is the pursuit of energy that encourages further self-replicating chains, right? And you need energy in order to do that. That's why we, you know, rotate around the sun. We wouldn't exist if that solar energy wasn't produced in surplus for us. So you the energy is the only thing anyone should be thinking about. And I don't think it ties down to fossil fuels or anything else, right? And then there's a question of, can I identify individual shortages that emerge along that process? And what you're really trying to identify is what's called a pinch point chart in commodities, where the supply and the inventory, the secondary supply that exists gets short enough that we begin rationalizing on the basis of price. That's what causes prices to spike. Right. If I suddenly just told you that, yes, nuclear is coming, but the secret ingredient to making nuclear work is silver wiring. Well, what's the price that I'd be willing to pay for silver? It's a lot. Right. And it's a lot higher than it is currently. And so those types of emergencies and those types of events can occur exactly like toilet paper during COVID. Right. Like, what do I desperately need? Toilet paper. 
Um, I, you know, just as a personal anecdote, uh, my wife and I, I sold our home. We became empty nesters last June, uh, a year ago, June. We sold our home in California uh, almost a year ago now. And we've just been traveling around, going to different Airbnbs. And one of the things that I'm actually encountering more and more and more are Japanese toilets where you don't need toilet paper, yeah. right? So, you know, like that's far more information than anybody wants to actually hear about my personal life. But the simple reality is, is that you actually replace toilet paper with an electric toilet that washes your butt and warms it and dries it and does all sorts of wonderful things that, you know, people will look back a hundred years and they're like, can you believe in the late 20th century and early 21st century, they used to take scraps of unsanitary paper and wipe their rectums with it. My God, what a disgusting policy, right? No different than us looking at chamber pots from the 18th century. Hmm. So, hmm. It, you know, these things are changing and they change in radical ways it just those radical changes happen in in you know uh, longer term periods than we tend to think about. Mm. That makes me even more bullish on uranium because uranium is used in certain ceramics, and these toilets require more ceramics. So there you go. That's the case. <laughs> there you go. I, I I honestly don't think the shortage of uranium for ceramics is going to actually be the driver of it. But yes, I, I we the 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 reality is is we will figure something else out if uranium becomes the shortage. And that is the way human innovation works, right? When confronted with higher prices, we create solutions because there's a monet, there's a there's a income incentive, a profit incentive to do so, and everybody else gets to benefit from it, right? That's I mean, I'm an ardent defendant of capitalism, is even as I highlight many of its flaws as it's currently constructed. What we're experiencing is capitalism light, I would describe, or capitalism corrupt. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, the the wonderful thing about capitalism is I don't have to be smart enough to solve the problem. I just have to be smart enough to pay somebody else who has solved the problem, right? And I, in the process of committing to do that, I create the incentives for them to take their time and energy to solve problems that are candidly too hard for me to solve. Yeah. And so what I, I, I agree, there's nothing to disagree in that view, um, or at least nothing that I can disagree with there. Uh, that over the long run, it just makes sense. And we always seem to solve that problem. It's just it literally always been that way but then and, and again at the same time you told me you agree with that that there's pockets of opportunities in there so going back to the previous question that i asked you like if i worked at let's say a wall street hedge fund or hedge fund yeah. owners but if i worked at a hedge fund manager the, the, you know helping them make investments and i wanted to pitch you know exposure to commodity what would it take to convince convince them like profits this quarter or, or an overarching thesis it's, like how, how do pretty, i do it's that pretty short term that's i mean again that's the frustrating part right because mm -hmm. from an investment standpoint you typically only as a professional investor you're typically given a window of anywhere from 12 to 36 months to demonstrate your investment prowess and so when if you believe strongly in something like uranium you basically have to pick an entry point into that story that results in profitability emerging in a very short a period of time really good friend of mine adam rodman um you know he was early to this process struggled for a year basically sitting there going like i feel like i've lost my mind and then has had tremendous success associated with it and once that success occurs you know he's able to continue to prosecute those opportunities but he's doing so from a personal standpoint of surplus that allows him to say it doesn't matter quite as much to me mm. right um for people who are new to the business, who are entering, that fortuitous timing or that ability to survive to that point is harder than for somebody like Adam. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And and Segra has just been a, a a unique, you know, participator in this space, and they've they've literally they did a, an amazing job together with Mike. Um, well, they they did two they things. Have... One, you know, the uranium story has existed for going on fifteen years, right? Mm -hmm. Adam actually very intentionally stepped in and said, look, a lot of the steps that have been taken by investors in this space to survive mean that they've actually diluted the message and the, the mechanisms to gain exposure in a significant way, right? The uranium ETFs had you know, transmogrified into basically you know, somewhat crappy mining ETFs. He was able to help refocus them, et cetera. Um, you know, and Kudos to him, right? It's he, Adam should be within the uranium community. I know he's extraordinarily well known and extraordinarily well respected, 
But the simple reality is, is that he did the exact same equivalent of Michael Burry walking into Goldman Sachs and saying, you know, hey, can you construct an option for me on mortgages? Mm -hmm. Right. He went in and he actually cleaned up the mechanisms in the industry and said, hey, I want to have vehicles that allow me to have exposure to this underlying theme that I think is really, really important. Yeah, that would actually be sort of my follow up question to when it comes down to commodities. What do you do? Like, let's say you agree with my pitch on on the thesis, um, but how do you get exposure to it as a as a money manager? You have to go for the large liquid vehicles, and because the industry has been starved for capital, there aren't that many. I mean, there's the large diversified miners, your BHP, Rio Tinto, whatever, but the largest yep. uranium companies, like I don't know, what I mean, 20, course, 20 billion dollars, yeah. something like that. That's nothing for yep. some of the large firms out there. 100%. And that actually in turn creates the conditions under which people really can't do that. So if you're, you know, take yourself out of this and now make yourself a registered investment advisor who has clients who have a lot of faith in you, you can't actually put them all into uranium because that would expose you to extraordinary liability. And again, mm -hmm. this is like the area, the, the area of work that I'm known for, nowhere near the sort of stuff that Adam has done. When you think about things like passive investing, my issues with passive investing are, are you know, uh, there's multiple components in the way that I would I would argue against it. The most important is, is that there is no such thing as passive investing. So just to orient your listeners, um, the definition of passive investing in the, um, uh, you know, most important document in terms of the history of passive investing is the work of Bill Sharp in identifying why passive investing outperforms a paper from 1991 called The Arithmetic of Active Management in which Bill Sharp notes that, you know, if active managers and passive managers are really doing what they're supposed to do, then by definition, passive managers have to own the exact same assets in totality as all the active managers. So they have the same underlying portfolio. Then the passive manager charges lower fees, which means that the passive manager will outperform the active manager, right? The problem is, is in that paper hidden in footnote number four is a declaration of what a passive investor is, which is somebody who never transacts. Mm. Right now, how do they get into the market? Well, that's magic. And how do you get out of the market? That's magic. And so unless you believe in magic, you can't actually believe in passive investing. It's not about whether they're going to outperform or underperform. It's just the actual definition is a violation of common sense. Mm. Right. And what we know is that passive investors are transacting on a continuous basis because they're being fed by things like 401k flows where money is constantly going in. And so the question actually is, how should we think about the impact of the world's simplest investment strategy, which is just, did you give me cash? If so, then buy, right? How does that change behaviors in markets? Mm. And that's what a lot of my work is largely around. Um, that's made worse by the, the lobbying activities of Vanguard and BlackRock, which is not only affecting things from an ESG type framework. Obviously, many of your, leader, your, your listeners are extremely familiar with the nonsense of Larry Fink's behavior over the last couple of years, trying to push people into ESG type yep. stuff. Yep. Um, but there is much more important lobbying that's going on that basically says if you are a, a company offering something like a 401k for which there are tremendous benefits for both your company on a tax basis and for your employees um, if you offer anything other than the lowest cost etf products you become subject to risks of liability you can get sued for having tried to select active managers trying to put money with somebody like Adam would actually expose you to liability if it ended up being wrong in any way, shape or form. Whereas if you put people into the S&P 500, you're largely protected from that, right? Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to joke that Einstein was wrong, very few things and exposing my incredible hubris at being able to say that, but Einstein was wrong. The most powerful force in the universe is not compound interest, it's liability avoidance. Right. And so what you've actually done is, is created an impulse that has driven people into passive vehicles. Those passive vehicles behave very differently than Adam. Right. Adam is saying, you know, there isn't an investment opportunity. There isn't a mechanism for people to gain access to this. So I'm going to try to create opportunities for people to invest in it. Mm -hmm. What you're identifying is there is actually no mechanism for most investment managers to 
or most individuals to choose to allocate their resources, their investment resources to things like uranium. It requires going through tremendous hoops. You've got to take activity. You've got to expose yourself to programs like this in a way that candidly is quite difficult. And ultimately what we've seen is it's proven to be far less rewarding than simply buying the S&P 500 with obviously isolated uh, uh, exceptions to that. Hmm. That right there is actually sort of a thesis that I've heard. I believe it was Doug Casey who said it, but he said, and it's sort of this belief that eventually money managers are going to wake up on commodities and they're all going to rush towards commodities. And that's going to create an event that is equal to trying to force the the contents of the Hoover Dam through a paper straw. That's how he describes it, um, which is to say that, you know, commodities are going to uh, commodity related equities are going to explode, basically. Why? I have a feeling you're probably going to disagree with that, but why Why? Why do you disagree with it? Well, I think there's two components to it, right? One is, is, is remember, as much as, as important as commodities are, right, in the same way that breathing oxygen is really important to us, right? You can't get away from it. Um, how much do you currently pay for the oxygen you're breathing? Hmm. Yeah. Not much, right? I mean, there's a ridiculous Dr. Seuss movie called um, The Lorax, I think it was, that they corrupted into, you know, this nonsense of people having to pay for oxygen and a monopoly emerging for clean air for people to breathe, right? Like, that's the giant fantasy in commodities, right? Is that, you know, ultimately, we have to have these things. And if we can just get people to pay more for them, right? It's same thing with Michael Burry going out and saying in the, the the conclusion to the big short, right? I'm totally focused on water, right? Yeah. Oh yeah. my gosh, water. We all need water, right? We're going to be paying much more for clean water, blah, blah, blah. Again, you know, expand the quantity of energy dramatically and desalinization means that we don't need water at all. In fact, that's the entire process of technology and technological development is taking what nature has historically done and doing it faster and cheaper and better and making it more accessible, right? The water cycle involves, you know, solar energy heating up uh, the oceans, evaporation occurring, the, the, the clouds, you know, shifting across, running into mountains where they encounter cool air and then the water precipitates, it flows down the mountainside into natural aquifers as it, you know, uh, you know, uh, slowly filters itself and, you know, Coors Light, you know, ultra pure water sort of thing. And then we're left with water that we're now storing in, in agricultural dams, right? Um, an alternative is simply to say, hey, let's take it directly out of the ocean by applying energy that we've created through nuclear power, mm. right? Um, you end water shortages. You turn California from a, from a, a desert into a, a water exporter par excellence because it actually has access to a coastline in which it can extract as much water as it possibly wants if energy is really cheap. Mm. So again, I keep going back to this point that like, there are no commodity shortages that are durable and sustainable except for energy. And that's largely the fact that, that we fail to invest in you know, nuclear, which you've correctly identified, at least here's one of the inputs. Now, whether it's nuclear or you know, uranium or thorium, I honestly don't care. I, I agree with you. I think it's really important but you are ultimately limited. The second reason why I disagree with Doug Casey is even in the limited circumstances that we have existed, commodities have moved from being the vast majority of our purchasing behavior to being the vast minority of our purchasing behavior. Right? I challenge any of your listeners to identify that they spend significant amounts of money on eggs. Right? Mm -hmm. Well, eggs were a primary source of sustenance for populations for years years and years and years and they remain so right but we don't spend any actual money on them they're just not actually very expensive and we can create as many of them as we want and we can immediately respond to the shortages that emerged in something like the COVID environment or in the aftermath of the avian flu which is really what hit that combination of the two yep. and we create conditions under which suddenly i'm back in the store and i'm like oh my gosh there's eggs everywhere and the eggs are really cheap again hmm. it's true um I saw a couple of news releases today, actually, around the evening flu. So there might be a second wave. I always joke about this kind of running joke on here, but no, good, good, good point. On <laughs> well, that. I'm pretty sure I've got the avian flu, but yeah. 
<laughs> Sorry, go ahead. On that, um, it, it's making me think about that exposure. Do you, do, do you believe that money managers ever go back to the exposures to commodities that they had in the 70s or even the early 2000s? No. No, I don't. And so I, I think this is one of the key problems with people pointing out things like, well, gold used to be X percent of the investment universe, right? Yeah. Never going back, right? Um, it's just, it, you know, it, it, if we move back to an environment in which scarcity looks like the 19th century and, you know, you have to hop into your covered wagon and, and ride into the store to get a bolt of cloth that your wife is going to sew together to create, you know, not only attractive skirts for your daughters, but also, you know, overalls for you. And maybe, but I don't think there's a high probability of that. Hmm. So if I look at the, I'm looking at a chart here. It says 71% of advisors have zero to 1% exposure to go. And then 27% have one to 5%, which is a virtually all of them have less than 5% exposure. Um, I mean, that, that doesn't shock you knowing that number. No. It doesn't because, yeah. I mean, again, gold was really important. Uh, again, let me show you an interesting chart. Um, hopefully, if you're, I mean, uh, by the way, I actually hope many in your audience disagree with me because that is part of what creates markets, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's actually really important for people to at least think about some of the narratives that they've been exposed to and, and ask themselves, are these true or, or untrue statements, right? Um, in particular, like if I look at, at the period of uh, the gold standard, you know, it was actually totally unsustainable. The reason why it broke is for the same reasons ultimately that I think Bitcoin will break. You, you can't have a system in which people are constantly facing scarcity of the underlying monetary asset. Right. You can actually go back and read the autobiography of Benjamin Franklin discussing the shortage of coin that existed in the city of Philadelphia in the 1700s. And the solution set promulgated by Ben Franklin, one of the smartest men alive, actually ended up being correct, which is let's just print paper money so that people can actually conduct transactions. And right? it led to far better outcomes under those conditions as a very regular feature. Um, gold worked really, really well to establish credit conditions amongst nation states in an environment in which global trade was expanding dramatically. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't actually mean anything, right? There is no higher power to gold. I've got a presentation somewhere out there on YouTube where I walk people through this underlying dynamic. And the thing to remember is, is that gold is ultimately an element on the periodic table that is no different than silver, no different than hydrogen. They're ultimately, it just exists on the periodic table. It has some very unique properties that are shared with other metallic uh, coinage. It is, you know, uh, very slow to oxidize. It doesn't actually oxidize or tarnish in the traditional sense which means that it can remain in its current form for an extended period of time. It was malleable at low temperatures, which meant even back in the 600 BC era, when it began to emerge in places like Parthia, you were able to strike coinage that identified it as uniquely belonging to the state and therefore could be used to pay taxation by the state. Um, it didn't, you know, poison you like uranium would. If you have uranium coins in your pocket, congratulations, you're a dead man. Um, if you have mercury in your pocket, congratulations, you're both crazy and a dead man. And your pocket is going to be empty fairly soon because it will eat its way through. Uh, sodium, if you have it in your pocket and you jump into a swimming pool, you're going to catch on fire. Same thing for lithium, et cetera, right? There's basically five metals, tin, nickel, um, iron, copper, and a few other, uh, iron's really not a great one, um, copper, um, copper, nickel, gold, silver, and I'm sure there's, uh, tin is another one. They all have those properties in general, and they've all been used for coinage in various countries around the world over various periods of time. There's nothing unique about gold except for its chemical properties as an element on the periodic table. Hmm. So like, as we move further and further away, from a subsistence society and into one in which we have very, very complex uh, 
and um, uh, sophisticated capacity to do things like create scarcity or prevent counterfeiting in other mechanisms, whether those are digital imprints or you know Bitcoin type uh, 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 algorithms that need to be demonstrated, we can move away from the need to effectively prevent counterfeiting through the scarcity of the metal itself. Hmm. Hmm. So what would it take for you to turn bullish on gold? You have another kid or something? I, I actually am. I, I actually think gold is interesting because among other things, gold has some unique properties to it. Hmm. Um, one is the general belief by a lot of people that it remains important in that context. The second one is, is that I do think that we're ultimately going to see further devaluation of the U.S. dollar because we're not doing a good job of investing otherwise, right? And so really what devaluation is, is it's a state-sponsored ability to say, yeah, that was really stupid what we did before, but we're going to forgive that, hmm. right? And if, if there's one thing that is in more surplus than quantities of gold or energy or Bitcoin or anything else, it's stupidity. That's right, yeah. And actually for people listening... Thinking where that joke came from about you having another kid in gold is that chart that you published a couple of days ago on Twitter of uh, history of the U.S. GDP in ounces of gold, yeah. and then people laughed about it being uh, the 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 weight of your kids or something along those lines. So that's where I'm coming. Yeah, from. I actually said it's my fault. You know, the, the joke on Twitter was I, I posted and I was feverish and and just playing around and actually looking at a few charts I hadn't looked at in a long time. And there's a, a a chart of the price of uh, what I did was posted U.S. GDP in gold terms, right? And turns out that there's basically two peaks, one of which is associated with my birth, and the second one was associated with my my oldest son's birth. Hmm. And the ratio of those two is almost identical to the differences in our birth weight. <laughs> um, I was six pounds, 15 ounces. He was, I call him gigantor. He was 10 pounds and a 10 and a half pounds at birth. And so I put those two on there, but they're almost identical to the ratio of the different peaks in GDP and gold terms between 2000 and 1970. Um, totally joking. It doesn't actually mean anything, but like I do very much pay attention to gold. And I think, by the way, I actually want to emphasize this, that gold is a wonderful currency if your purchasing activity is denominated or dominated by commodities, right? Because gold does have a really interesting property. Unlike all other commodities, it's a catalyst you know, that isn't consumed by weight, right? So copper, I can improve the technology in terms of copper wiring that allows me to use less copper to send a single electron or to send lots and lots of electrons, right? Mm -hmm. That in turn means that the price of copper per unit of activity, economic activity, is going to fall over time. But because gold has very few industrial applications and is really only used in a monetary construct in which its measure of value is defined by its weight, right? A gram of gold or an ounce of gold, if you insist upon not adopting the metric system. By the way, I haven't either, so I'm an American like, every, like, like most of your other listeners. But the, the simple reality is, is that gold is denominated in weight terms, whereas copper is evaluated relative to its utility. Hmm. So technology allows the price of copper to fall continuously against the price of gold. That's why you saw the deflationary characteristics of most prior periods. And again, people will point to that and like, oh, it's because we moved off gold. No, we moved off gold because we could no longer remain on gold with the population increases that we experienced. It is coincidental that it was deflationary because of that underlying characteristic. And I, I maintain charts of commodity prices in gold precisely for that reason. I want to actually understand how it's relating versus a fixed unit, but that doesn't mean that I want to adopt that as my currency. Hmm. But, but how then do you get exposure to it? That's, again, a challenging thing because if you say go for the miners, they have their own issues right now, labor shortages we talked about that they have. Uh, had inflationary pressures and so on and so forth. So how do you how do you get exposure to it? So I I just hold physical gold. I mean mm -hmm. I I have some in my portfolio in the form in, in my professional portfolios in the form of futures exposure or ETF exposure. Uh, and just do it in the lowest cost possible format. Um, and then I hold some physical gold in the you know adverse chance that I'm just wrong. Right. Um, that's fine. I, I I get to be wrong like everybody else does. Right. Um, 
And that was purchased at dramatically lower prices, just to be very clear. But I have a reasonable enough quantity of gold that if it got stolen from me, my life would not end. Um, if you know the world comes to a conclusion in which I'm totally wrong and we move back to gold as a monetary mechanism, I'll be fine. I won't mm. change my living standards in any meaningful way. Well, as the Casey says, it's not going to change what you have for breakfast now that we're talking about him. But uh, yeah, let me know when you have another 10 pound baby and then I'm going to sell my gold. <laughs> there you go. No, probably, it, would, it, would, it would probably be a grandchild. But yes, that's uh, then just to orient you. We're probably 10 years out from that. Um, <laughs> so we'll, we'll see. But if anything, the cycle, I think, is actually going to go in the opposite direction. I think it's really important. You know, the, the piece that I, I highlighted that I shared with you from Substack was called is the age of deprivation coming to a close? And I really do ultimately believe that. I think that, you know, contrary to the, the overwhelming narrative, we have largely existed throughout the course of certainly my adult life, likely your entire life, in a period of relative deprivation where we've just made really bad policy choices in terms of development, right? We've made effectively the human second choice um, and done so for really unscientific and unprincipled reasons that I think are slowly coming to a close. Mm. I was I mean, just imagine, uh, imagine you're right about the uranium thesis mm. and suddenly we move back to that trend and all of your listeners are suddenly saying, boy, you know, I'm really looking forward to my vacation on the moon in both winter and summer. Right. That strikes me as a world that doesn't look remotely like the world that we currently inhabit. One in which I have, you know, I, I like to point out to people that we talk about slavery having been outlawed. We've got tons of slaves in our households that our ancestors couldn't have imagined. Right. The stove that you cook your food on doesn't require somebody to go out and bring wood into your house and chop it and set it on fire and heat up water and everything else to cook your rudimentary food. You've got a really sophisticated mechanism that delivers energy to you with no effort on your part. That's a slave. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and it's highly unlikely to revolt or cut your slit your throat in the middle of the night. So it's slightly better. Right. We're moving to that where in just the past couple of years, we've moved from vacuum cleaners that you push around to increasingly sophisticated and successful robotic vacuums that are becoming dispersed in everyone's house. If you wanted to have entertainment in the 17th century, you'd have to learn how to play the piano and become a skilled singer or pay somebody to show up in your house to do that. Thomas Edison provided a solution for that and for us that provided a solution for that for us in a rough form. And now most of us are in homes in which we're so distracted by our entertainment choices that we don't even bother to look at the big screens. We're trapped looking at small screens that we carry around with us all the time. Mm -hmm. Right. So, I mean, the human condition is one in which we're getting more and more resources thrown at us. We just value them less and less. And that's ultimately what deflationary technology is ultimately about. Right. Uh this might be a podcast in and of itself, inflation versus deflation, because of the levels of debt we have and how we deal with that. Uh, but you are right on the point of policy choices. I was, as I was about to say, I was, I was born in post-communist uh, Eastern Europe, Bulgaria, to be specific. Yeah. So I know all about bad policy choices, unfortunately. But I also know about the cartoons that I used to watch in the 90s, which was like the Jeffersons, for example, old cartoons that were not actually from the 90s, but I watched them in the 90s. Um, You'd see flying cars or whatever. You would imagine that that's what the future was go going to be. You know. By the way, that, that was the Jetsons. The Jeffersons was actually a sitcom that involved a affluent black family and the foibles that they encountered as they moved up through society. Um, but I meant the Jetsons, the Jetsons yes, yeah, the flying yeah. Cars, I misspoke. Yeah, but you're right. And so we're not getting that, um, which in a sense, you know, tempers my expectations for. Uh, where the future is going to be like when everybody says, oh, we're all going to be driving electric and we're only going to have solar and wind power. Therefore, all that demand for lithium and silver and whatever is going to materialize. That's why I'm kind of weary of demand driven theses. Like I prefer a supply driven thesis, if that makes sense to you, like the shortage of uranium. Well, yeah, no, I, I understand. But unfortunately, I think it's important to recognize is that both have to. Like, but by the way, I actually think your background coming from a communist society actually may bias you in that direction. I think that right. actually could hurt you, right? Um, being concerned about supply shortages and persistent supply shortages 
makes perfect sense when you suppress price signals. But if you allow price signals to actually indicate shortage, then you encourage supply and you encourage substitution and you encourage conservation, right? And so the supply driven shortages tend to resolve themselves relatively quickly and relatively easily. Mm. We didn't stop using whale oil because we ran out of whales. We stopped using whale oil because we developed incredible substitutes that were far more powerful and far less labor intensive in their production far more consistent in their delivery, right? Um, I think that's going to be the case going forward. And so I, I would encourage you from an investment framework to incorporate both aspects of it. I think you've got the absolute right story when you think about the demand characteristics of uranium, or you think about the demand characteristics of power. And again, I would go back to you know the chart that I shared with you around the, the energy shortage, the energy deficit that we've allowed to emerge relative to trend that's why we don't have flying cars, because flying cars take a tremendous amount of energy, right? Rolling wheels, the invention of the wheel is unique because it minimizes the surface contact and the friction on a fixed surface, right? That lowers the energy content of rolling something forward. An internal combustion engine is simply a mechanism for powering an axle that then takes advantage of that property. If you're gonna have something flying, you actually have to fight gravity. It requires an incredible amount of energy. And we can have that, right? We absolutely will have it at some point in the future. But the energy content of that, you know, folding briefcase that George Jetson used to fly to work, which in and of itself is kind of funny because like, think about this, you and I have flown to this meeting with incredibly low energy content. We're able to interact face to face in a manner that would have mystified our ancestors and neither of us had to work very hard for it. Yeah. Right. That's I mean, that's that's actually remarkable. It's far less than the cost of a postage stamp, certainly inflation adjusted versus the 19th century. Yeah, I think actually. So the very software we use, Zoom, is actually free you know, as far as I know, or maybe it has a very low cost, something like an annual thing. But yeah, I mean, you're, you're very right on that. Um, and but that, that is why communist systems fail, right? Because they suspend yeah. price signals in favor of perceived or declared central, you know, by a central power, the need, need that you have for this. And that's why I like, look, there's a lot of things that I say that sound, you know, Pollyanna-ish, but I look at the behavior of administrations that try to suppress price signals. And I'm like, oh my gosh, guys, you are setting up disaster. That's not how the system is supposed to work. As true. long as you actually have the price signals, I have such incredible faith in my fellow man to solve those problems for me. I'm just not going to worry that much about it. Yeah. And and it's I mean you're right to to talk about this because I feel like there's there's sort of two subsets of people who are bullish on commodities. There's those who say, "Hey, there's going to be a supply glut happening and there's going to be a short period of time where there might be a spike. I can take advantage of that." Very few ever do. Most of them stick around for it to go even higher, and then it just reverses back to the mean. Yep. So you have that other subset that says, oh, no, we're going into a commodity super cycle that's going to go on for 30 years where copper is going to be you know, 10 bucks for the next 20 years or something like that. And then I'm reminded yep. of something. One of the other people who I talk to within the commodity space, Rick Rule, always says that the cure for high prices is high prices, is high prices. which is essentially yep. what you told me here. Yeah, I think that's really, really important. And and the scarcity mindset, right? The idea that somehow or another, I'm going to benefit from other people's deprivation. I, I actually think that's a core part of the problem that we experience, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, what we really want is what many of us experienced over the course of the 20th century, which is far more of us moving further and further away from subsistence than had ever occurred before. And at every step in that process, people scream from the rooftops how unsustainable it is, right? But the reality is, is as long as we're sending people the signals that reward innovation, they're going to come up with things I couldn't have imagined. And now, by the way, we're adding intelligence in the form of AI that enhances that capability and allows us to theoretically do far more, right? I mean, Google is using things like their, their programs, similar programs that were used for solving chess and Go, right, to discover how to fold and unfold proteins that's creating the potential for discoveries that we haven't, couldn't have possibly imagined. But what was required to do that was to put an unbelievable amount of energy towards it. 
Mm. And so again, like I love the emphasis that you have on nuclear and the focus on uranium as a potential enabler of that. I just encourage you to also recognize that that's coming from an abundance mindset rather than a scarcity mindset. Mm. You um told me you had plans with with your wife, so I don't keep you all day. My wife actually just opened the door to my office and peeked her head in. So, well, you you said you had a hard time dating, and I disagree because she brought you a ten uh you know ten pound baby, and uh, luckily <laughs> I married. That's true. Luckily, I married the first girl who ever saw me naked, so I didn't really have a hard time dating either. But I'm just just one last thing here. Uh, with jokes aside, I'm listening sure. to you speak, and and you're doing a good job of dumbing this down for me. So I'm half understanding what you're trying to tell me. But I'm thinking back at a at at, at a at a tweet. Someone so, no, it actually it was a response to a tweet that I had put out. I said something about yeah. the lines of macro being hard, or just everything was hard. And someone said that it didn't really matter what happens in macro anyways, because the the only thing that that they thought matters is whether the Fed would cut or raise rates. Wow. And so yeah. go long on years, they're cutting, go short on years, they're hiking. That was a conclusion. Um, but I have a feeling you disagree with that. Well, 20, I mean, 2023 is a perfect example of a year in which they hiked. But if you had been short, you got destroyed. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, look, I mean, As human beings, we economize the resources that we put towards it. People who are overly, so, you know, there's the meme in Bitcoin land, right? You know, the super dumb person, the person in the middle, and the person who's extremely brilliant, right? The person in the middle is like, oh, no, 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 no. I'm probably that person in the middle, to be entirely honest. I'm not that smart, so I'm probably not, you know, the person who's like, oh, here's, you know, the super sophisticated way to think about it. Um, but, I, you know, it is a very complicated answer. And so I actually think a large portion of what occurred last year had very little to do with the Fed. Many people have commented that the Fed's hiking has so far had very limited effects in the economy in total. And I think that's actually probably true. I think it's created underlying fractures that are beginning to manifest themselves in those who need to obtain access to debt. But most people in the developed world and most corporations in the developed world You know, the Fed hikes interest rates that affects today's interest rates. If I don't have to use today's interest rates, it's not going to meaningfully affect me. Mm. And so, you know, a lot of debt and a lot of exposure was termed out, whether that's fixed rate mortgages, et cetera. Those had huge implications in terms of the transmission mechanism into the economy. No, I just don't think it's that simple. Right. And um, maybe I'm wrong, but I have never seen that to be the case. Right. At every stage in the process, I've heard, don't fight the Fed. And that has always been true when the Fed is cutting, whether the Fed is hiking, et cetera. And it, it has never in any way demonstrably yielded you know, results in one direction or another. Now, again, I do think that they're actually mechanical components. And so I just want to emphasize as more and more people are in things like target date funds that mechanically allocate resources in your investment portfolio between bonds and equities. When the Fed hikes interest rates, they are going to affect fixed income securities, right? There's an arbitrage that exists there. And so what the Fed, I actually think, did in 2022 was hike interest rates that lowers the price of bonds, same thing that ultimately destroyed Silicon Valley Bank or created the conditions that allowed Silicon Valley Bank to fail. Hmm. Um, they lo lower the price of bonds. If the price of bonds go down in a portfolio that is a fixed allocation between equities and bonds, what do I have to do? I have to sell it equities buy bonds. And you can see this pattern play through in 2022, where the Fed was hiking aggressively and bonds were being hit. Really, the interesting thing about 2023 is, is that there was no change in interest rates, right? Yes, the Fed hiked at the front of the curve, but the duration sensitive components really ended the year largely unchanged. And so you just didn't see that same rebalancing impact. Um, I think it played through slightly differently, but I do not think it's as simplistic as that individual or, or you presented. No, it's um, you're right. Um, but that I, I, I feel like if I say end the Fed, which is a, a popular hashtag, we might open a whole exactly. lot of can of worms. But uh, and that's something maybe we should talk about next time because uh, you the the thing you spend most of your time looking into, as far as I understand it, big part of that is labor market. But just you can you can umbrella that by saying macro. And uh, for people listening, that's at yes, I give a fig with F I G at the end.com. That's a substack that Michael writes at. And he's also Prof Plum 99 on uh, 
Twitter. So Michael, thank you so much for investing your time in me. Antonio, it was a real pleasure. Thank you so much. I appreciate it.